Today, I'll be lecturing on a new chapter, which is of great importance to me. Scholars have been keenly interested in how to explain an individual's life, basically, how to pinpoint the one deciding factor for success. In other words, what is a good predictor for success in people's lives? Have you considered what indicators might reveal how successful an individual will be? How can we foresee the kind of life we will live, how our partners will live, and most importantly, how our children will live? Consequently, scholars are interested in what makes someone's life successful and what we can do to achieve success. From now on, I'm planning to lecture on that topic which is also a part of capital. During this fourth industrial revolution, many academic studies are being published regarding what determines one's success in life. I'd like to emphasize that humility is the most important quality when embracing new knowledge or new information. Scientific research is being done on the phenomena that occur in our brains when we receive new knowledge and new information with a humble attitude. The brains of people who think they know everything don't develop. New studies confirm that our brains do improve when we accept new knowledge and information openly. We get smarter as our brains strengthen existing neural networks and create new ones. It's safe to conclude that humble people will succeed because they become smarter and have better judgment thanks to their improved brains. Doesn't he look familiar? Dale Carnegie developed remarkable theories regarding interpersonal skills. His books remain very popular to this day and the ones about interpersonal skills are steady sellers. His quotes are numerous enough to be made into a book. I've chosen one quote here. The way to spin a pinwheel without wind is to run forward. When there's wind, everyone's pinwheel spins. Isn't that true? Anyone can spin their pinwheel. However, with no wind, no one's pinwheel spins. In other words, when the economy is developing or growing, everyone's business does well and is successful. Things run smoothly. On the other hand, in this slow economy and in this age of information, Having only manual labor isn't enough to keep it spinning. We would be bound for destruction. Chicken eateries and coffee shops are experiencing their worst times in Korea. Have you read the article about 9 down out of 10? 9 out of 10 businesses go bankrupt. You shouldn't pay attention to the unsuccessful ones and focus on those that succeed they are running forward with the pinwheel. You shouldn't run with all your might towards the chicken eatery or the coffee shop. Your business will go down for sure. In my neighborhood, a new hair salon recently opened in addition to two already struggling ones. I see signs that all three of them are going bankrupt. The lights aren't on in those salons, which is a bad sign. You're bound for failure if you involve yourself in a doomed business. Then, what should you do? Where should you run to? Towards the doomed ones? Which direction should you choose? You must know where you're going. Most of all, you must have the desire to run. Why bother running when you really don't want to? Simply put, you must have an adventurous spirit, passion, and perseverance. You must run all the way. You must run until the pinwheel spins. Next, you need discipline for the head, information, 
knowledge and a direction to run towards. Again, no amount of planning or knowledge will take you to your goals unless you put them into action. There's a saying, no mill, no meal. No matter how close the mill is, not working will not get you a meal. What I do in Atomy is teach you about the disciplines of the heart, head, and hands, which comprise the human body. All of you are here today to get new information. What is information? How can you define it? You probably thought you knew until I asked you, and now you are drawing a blank. There are so many information experts out there. There are as many definitions as there are information experts. I really only like two of the many definitions. One is something that creates a difference. If you realize something is different, that is information. If what you see is always the same, there is no information. If you think, Atomy is different from other outfits, and realize that difference, you have information. I'd like to introduce the father of information theory, Claude Shannon, who said that all tools that decrease entropy or uncertainty is information. Applying this theory to Atomy, you might feel nervous, thinking it might be a scam. However, when you learn the information about it, your uncertainty decreases. Everything that reduces uncertainty about what you should do in the future is information. Therefore, if you're sitting here mindlessly, you won't get any information. You must recognize the difference from other MLMs and learn how Atomy can reduce the uncertainty you have if you want to gain information. Recently, experts have said that the information gap is more problematic than the wealth gap to ordinary people. In other words, high income earners or the upper class always gain new information, analyze it and use it to their advantage, while the ordinary people who have no new information are completely unaware. They're even unaware of the fourth industrial revolution. You might think there are too many cues here. Many scholars, especially psychologists, have been studying since 1905 for nearly a century to determine the one factor that determines an individual's success. In other words, they've been trying to locate the one factor that can predict what kind of life an individual will have. What could possibly tell you that? You just knew it until I asked, right? At first, scholars thought it was IQ. However, a hundred years of studies have revealed that IQ can't explain how people will live their lives. Again, IQ alone can't predict how people will live their lives. How did they reach that conclusion? IQ didn't predict it correctly. Long-term studies of over 70 years proved that IQ is not the deciding factor. So scholars wanted to find out, then, what actually determines one's life direction. While doing so, many other quotients were born. There are even more quotients out there than the ones you see here. Let me start with EQ, which means emotional quotient which many believed would replace IQ. AQ means adversity quotient and is believed to determine people's lives based on their ability to overcome hardship. I'm going to come back to this shortly. W key is willpower quotient and is believed to determine people's lives based on their willpower. MQ is moral quotient, which gauges the strength of your morals. HQ means humor quotient. It can mean either humor or health quotient, it's up to you. 
None of these can foresee conclusively whether a person will succeed or fail. Fortunately, in the wake of the fourth industrial revolution, many medical and psychiatric studies are being done to prove how these quotients can analyze people's lives. If IQ is not the one deciding factor in an individual's life, what is? Many quotients have been introduced, and I'm not saying they're not important. Quotients are a good indicator for success in a specific area. But they can't be applied to explain all fields. There isn't a single indicator that can predict success in entrepreneurs, religious leaders, journalists, educators, financial moguls or sports stars. However, many academics have been studying to find that clue. And one recent study produced a result that's been proven scientifically. The study result has been made into a book. The author is a Chinese-American. Her father and mother are both Chinese. Her parents used to be in the chemical business and ran a big plant. They immigrated to the U.S. during the communist regime and had two daughters. Are you all familiar with the global company called DuPont? Her father worked for them and wished for his daughters to be geniuses. Right, the daughters were not super smart, just like you and me here. They were average. Angela Duckworth took a genius test when she was in third grade, and her father wished but failed the test. She was not a born genius. Regardless, she won a Genius Award in 2013, which was the MacArthur Fellowship. What does this tell you? This woman showed that even if you are not a born genius, you can still become one by trying hard. She graduated cum laude from Harvard with a neurobiology degree. She had it really tough at Harvard. Later, she went on to receive a master's in neuroscience from Oxford University and got a six-figure job at a prominent corporation. While studying at Harvard, she taught at summer schools. There are many underprivileged youngsters in America. While teaching low-income children at a summer school, she traveled about the town of Boston seeking donations for her summer school, but was turned down nine times out of ten. Angela and her friend founded a school of their own. What made her want to do that? She had always thought the God-given mission of hers was to teach underprivileged children. Leaving a high-paying job in consulting, she took a job teaching math to 7th graders in a New York public school. 7th grade in America corresponds to the first year of middle school in Korea. While teaching in that middle school, she noticed something odd. While grading test papers, she discovered that high scorers had low IQs, while students with very high IQs did poorly on tests. The conclusion was that test performance and IQ are not proportionate, and IQ is not a predictor of success. It really doesn't matter whether you got an A or an F on tests in school. Test scores are a type of achievement which are usually interpreted as success by society. Angela became interested in discovering what exactly determines one's success. She was sure that it was an IQ. She wanted to figure out how students with low IQs performed well in school and looked for signs of what made them successful in both school and life. In order to investigate the causes, she studied psychology as a graduate student at the University of Pennsylvania, where world-renowned psychologist Martin Seligman worked. Over the next 10 years, she did research to find that indicator. In the end, she found it. 
She accumulated 10 years of research data into a thesis for her PhD. She called the indicator of success in one's life grit. According to her, what makes a difference is perseverance and passion. This must last a great deal of time to achieve success. Angela emphasizes that passion must last until death. She performed many experiments to confirm her conclusion, proving her theory valid. You must push all the way with perseverance and passion. That's what this book is all about. What is the second chapter be about? Can you build grit? In other words, is grit inherited or acquired? Is grit hereditary or learned? This is a very important question. If it is hereditary, you can blame your parents all you like and feel sorry for your pitiful self. Interestingly, over 10 years of research has concluded that grit is something that can be learned or acquired. You have only yourself to blame for your failures. Don't blame God, the Creator, or your parents, but yourself. That's the second part. The third topic is how to raise your children. How can you raise your children to be equipped with grit? That is the ultimate goal for the author. As a parent, how can you raise your children to have grit? How can you strengthen your students as a teacher and your partners as a sponsor in the pursuit of success? She worked to finally answer these questions. The book talks about in what situations we can follow our passion without giving up. We can do so when our interests and the interests for society coincide. Research shows that when people are only interested in their own welfare, their passion dissipates soon after making a lot of money. Let's assume that your goal is to make both you and your partners happy and contributing to society. Making yourself successful is seeking your personal interest. Making your partner successful is a public interest. When these two goals coincide, you can go the distance. Therefore, when people's personal interests and those of society coincide, people can live their lives with passion and perseverance. That is the conclusion of this book. It does sound a bit difficult. It's grit. Some of you might say it as grunt or grat. The word actually carries many meanings such as passion or persistence, among others. The Korean translator wrote an additional explanation of the word, since it can't really be directly translated. The final translation was perseverance with passion, which was too wordy. The explanation says it can be also translated as fighting spirit. Fighting spirit. Even though I'm not an expert in Korean, I don't like it. Is there any good Korean translation for this word? We have something like guts, but that really isn't very accurate. So my colleagues and I came up with the closest translation, which is tenacity. Tenacity is usually used for the underdog, not the favorite. It is rarely used for those already on top. When the underdog doesn't go down easily, he is said to have tenacity. When people have it easy, we don't say they have tenacity. Tenacity is used to portray those who run, fall, and pull themselves back to their feet. People who become an ASM within five years have tenacity. They never give up. In her book, Angela tells us that mentors play a very important role in developing grit or tenacity. For us, these are sponsors. One word can stop people from giving up. 
even at the very moment that they are about to. Let's take a look. In these different contexts, one characteristic emerges as the best predictor of success. I translated one of her speeches. It wasn't social intelligence or good looks or physical health or IQ. Those traits are either unrelated or very remotely related. What then is the true predictor of success? It is grit. Grit is passion and perseverance for very long-term goals and can be interpreted as tenacity in Korean. Grit is sticking with your future day in and day out, not just for a month, but for years and working really hard to make that future a reality. Grit is living life like it's a marathon, not a sprint. Running fast early in the race doesn't bring you to the finish line any sooner. You must run with all your might for the entire race. She says, grit is usually unrelated to talent. Prodigious talent is no guarantee of grit or inversely related to measures of talent. People with high IQs don't make a lot of effort. It is a fact that our brains improve when we work on them. From the book, our potential is one thing, what we do with it is quite another. We are all born with talent, but if we don't develop it, it can't work as a measure for success. Only when you work hard on your potential and stay loyal to it can it be realized. Now, many school teachers might wonder how they can build grit in their students. Naturally, they would want to know this. Teachers ask how they can build grit or tenacity in their students to prepare them to succeed in life. The best way to build grit is to have a growth mindset. This idea was developed by Dr. Carol Dweck a professor of psychology at Stanford University. With her mindset theory, she contributed significantly to the field of education. What is mindset really? It can be translated as way of thinking in Korean or to frame of thinking or structure of thoughts. It's a set of assumptions or methods held by individuals that adopt prior behaviors, choices, and attitudes. A recent study shows that Mindset predicts one behavior and way of thinking and determines success in people's lives. There are two types of mindset, fixed and growth. People with a fixed mindset believe their basic abilities, intelligence and talents are unchanging. They view failure as a simple lack of necessary basic abilities. They settle with whatever they have. People with a growth mindset believe that their talents and abilities can be developed through effort, good teaching and persistence. By applying this mindset to the Atomy business, you can develop your sales abilities. By continuously attending seminars and having consultations and meetings with your sponsor, even if you're not very good at sales right now. In other words, a fixed mindset is a closed mind, whereas a growth mindset is an open mind. I can do it. I am smart enough. Angela Duckworth proved that if you make an effort and acquire new knowledge and information, you can become smarter. She wasn't a child prodigy, but later received a genius award. Many wise people have been saying the same thing. What did Seneca say? Fate leads the willing and drags along the reluctant. It's another interpretation of mindset. As long as you have a growth mindset, you can choose your own fate. To sum up, if you make an effort, learn, and practice, you can always succeed. There isn't any difficult problem that I can't solve. This is the attitude you should have. We all have different credentials, different educational backgrounds, ages, beliefs, and religions. Nevertheless, 
we should share one thing together. Stick to your goals with tenacity and grit. By doing so, your brains will develop, half smarters will become full smarters, and you will become a CM like the one you see over there. I can be a crown master. You can make it, right? I wish success to every one of you. Thank you for listening.